seems to me we grow defensive when someone criticizes our most cherished ideals. But if the assailant is erudite, eloquent, or witty, that drives us nuts. <laughs> and perhaps that goes some way to explaining how our guest, despite being so many things of renown, is still often introduced with the simple moniker, controversial. American-born Lionel Shriver is a columnist in Britain's The Spectator, a former columnist at Harper's, and she has written widely for the New York Times, The Guardian, The London Times, Prospect, The Financial, the Financial Times, and many other publications. Her Harper's piece, Semantic Drift, appears in the best American essays of 2020. As a fiction writer, she has published 14 novels, including the bestsellers, The Mandibles, Big Brother, Post-Birthday World, and the Orange Prize for Fiction winner, We Need to Talk About Kevin, which was also a 2011 feature film starring Tilda Swinton. She's also received the 2014 BBC National Short Story Award, her most recent novel is Should We Stay or Should We Go, released 2021. Uh, but we're here tonight in anticipation of Shriver's first nonfiction book, Abominations, Selected Essays from a Career of Courting Self-Destruction. And this will be published in three weeks, uh, I believe September, 2022. Uh, and I was quite happy to receive an advanced copy of the text and while not a memoir, we learn a lot about Lionel in this text. She writes about her adolescence, a time when finding herself to be a tomboy, she changed her name from Margaret to Lionel. About her family, her love of tennis, her move from the US to the UK, about her early struggles to establish a career as an author. Together, the essays make for exquisite reading, but I wouldn't be surprised if reviews uh, seize upon the sections of her political commentary that were the most controversial. In particular, the book includes three pieces, each of which, as Shriver explains, almost got her canceled. One instance came when she wrote about a familiar third rail, immigration. In 2021, she published a spectator piece highlighting demographic transformation in Britain. And she noted, quote, for the country's original inhabitants to confront becoming a minority, which is estimated to be the case in 2060, uh, with any hint of mournfulness, much less consternation, is now racist beyond the pale." End quote. But Shriver's other two dances with cancellation stemmed from her commentary on what might seem like a more politically benign subject, fiction writing and publishing. In 2016, she gave a now famous speech to the Brisbane Writers' Festival. In it, Shriver criticized prevailing sensitivities about cultural appropriation. Appropriation, she claimed, is at the heart of fiction writing. Quote, who is the appropriator par excellence, really? Who dares to get inside the very heads of strangers? Who has the chutzpah to project thoughts and feelings into the minds of others? Who steals their very souls? Who is a professional kidnapper? Who swipes Every sight, smell, sensation, or overheard conversation like a kid in a candy store, and sometimes takes notes the better to purloin whole worlds. Who is the premier pickpocket of the arts? The fiction writer, that's who, end quote. She argues new sensitivities or prohibitions of speaking with others' voices, of speaking outside your lane or lived experience, threaten to kill fiction as we know it. Memoir will be the only politically defensible literary genre. Triver argued further that without fiction, we may lose both an art form and a good. Quote, the spirit of good fiction is one of exploration, generosity, curiosity, audacity, and compassion. Fiction helps to fell the exasperating barriers between us, and for a short while allows us to behold the astonishing reality of other people. End quote. Speech sparked condemnation, including a lengthy attack on The Guardian by one of the at attendees. An article Shriver penned in The Spectator caused a similar uproar. In 2018, she responded to the news that publishing giant Penguin Random House in Britain adopted the goal of making its own staff 
and its authors reflect the demographic profile of UK society by 2025. This makes the company something other than what it claimed to be, she argued. Quote, many of our institutions no longer understand what they are for. Drunk on virtue, Penguin Random House no longer regards the company's raison d'etre as the acquisition and dissemination of good books. Rather, the organization aims to mirror the percentages of minorities in the UK population with statistical precision. The piece spurred, end quote, the piece spurred a, a, a Twitter acid bath, if I might borrow a term from Mark Lilla, as well as, again, a letter of protest in The Guardian. Controversial, yes. That's actually not what I see as being most noteworthy about our guests this evening. What catches my eye is not just that I share her skepticism that new political imperatives uh, can be as easily integrated into our core institutions and practices as some suggest. Not only that I relish hearing her skewer exercise culture, especially in Boulder, Colorado, sorry. <laughs> not only that I identify and admire her when she says that being told she isn't allowed to empathize with someone makes her want to do it even more. <laughs> Not only that I respect people who are willing to pay a price for their voice. Rather, what matters most to me is that the conversation she ignites reveal an urgent truth, that the center of politics is not the voting booth or an opinion poll, but culture. And while I encourage, uh, we're gonna be looking in, in this conversation at her text, at her new book, Abominations. We'll be looking in particular at the question of her cancellation. Uh, why it became an issue and how close we came to it. And while I encourage the audience to ask any questions at the end of our conversation, Lionel and I uh, do plan to focus our initial conversation, as I say, on those subjects and the responses they provoked. With that lengthy introduction, apologies for it. Please join me, everyone, in welcoming Lionel. Thank you, Benjamin. Welcome to Now Boulder. I don't have to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it would be, tip, I'm, I'm an academic, we're at a university. Uh, we do these sorts of things. We have to always initiate any conversation with definitions, right? Uh, cancellation, what would that entail for someone like yourself? My not being here. Okay. Right? We can start with that. Um, I think it's all about denying people uh, access to amplification. So it's, it's very related to media and also employment. Uh, you are silenced. I mean, obviously you can shout at the TV screen as usual, but you, uh, nobody, is going, nobody else is, but your exasperated husband is going to hear you. Um, and you know, I found it very interesting that, that uh, people on the left became quite adamant that there was no such thing as cancel culture. Um, and and, and they, they said that a little too vociferously for my tastes, in which case, it, you know, you know they, they verified that there certainly is. Um, I think the ugliest side of cancel culture is not the... Um, individuals whom we largely know about who, who have either been canceled or you know, there's been an attempt on their careers. Uh, the most conspicuous example is JK Rowling. You know, there have been a lot of people trying very hard to make her go away and you can see how successful it's been. Uh, I, I would even say that a lot of people in the public eye have managed to benefit from the kind of attention that attempts to silence them in the public sphere uh, have, have produced. And, and therefore, you know, people who were lesser known to begin with, someone like Joshua Katz, um, Princeton, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't used to know who Joshua Katz was. So now I do, and I, I have a feeling he probably faces a lot more opportunities professionally than he did to begin with. Those are in some ways not the people I'm most concerned with. I think 
a lot of people who have already made a name for themselves will land on their feet. But behind the scenes, I think there are a lot of people who have medium level jobs and said something in the workplace or on social media that didn't go down well and, and get fired and get kicked off social media and have their lives fall apart. And I think that's the most worrisome side of this cultural phenomenon. Do you think a lot, one of the rejoinders that we hear about cancel culture is that it's a new, it's a new name for an old and, and by the way, virtuous practice, which is policing some standard for public discourse. How do you distinguish cancel culture from, let's say, a potentially healthy uh, scrutiny of each other's thoughts and words? Well, I guess I'm, I go for the market solution. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, in publishing, for example, if you write things that most people find obnoxious, then you're not going to sell that many books. Uh, and, and I can see why an editor would say, you know, this, there is no audience for this. This is too ridiculous or extreme. Um, so we're not going to take a commercial risk on that. But that is not the reasoning behind shying away from a lot of books. It's almost as if the fear is absolutely the opposite, that, that there is an audience for this book. And it's more a, a matter of uh, PR self-protection. They don't want to be responsible for it. And there have been repeated e examples. You know, Woody, Woody Allen's memoir uh, was withdrawn. The contract was uh, broken uh, because the staff at Hachette uh, objected to the book, bought into Dylan Farrow's dubious stories of child abuse at his hand. Um, well, it went on to sell magnificently. Uh, I think it, it, the, there's a press called One World, if I recall correctly, it's, uh, and, and boy, it, it made that company's budget. So that's a good example of the problem wasn't that that it's not commercially viable because it's so, you know, such an outsider perspective or it's so, you know, there's something so awful about it. It was commercially viable. And, uh, you know, I, other than that, I, I don't think we need um, intervening, intervening um, parties to protect the public from, from its own tastes in its own opinions. If, if we think of your case, uh, you've written a lot. <laughs> you've written a lot of, of course, fiction, but nonfiction as well. And yet, as we learn in your, in your latest book, three moments, three pieces stood out. Uh, two, uh, two on publishing, one on cultural appropriation and fiction, the other on immigration. Mm -hmm. um, if we could start with cultural appropriation, uh, the, the speech that, that has stuck with you, I've heard you say almost- uh, It's followed me. Regrettably, right? You'd like to be able to talk about other things I've heard you say in the past, but cultural appropriation becomes this, uh, you, you occupied a, a central place in that public conversation. Why, why does, first to begin with, uh, why does a fiction writer have to be so concerned about cultural appropriation? Why is it an affront to your art? Um, this is central to fiction writing and what, what, what people who write novels and stories do. They make people up. And uh, cultural appropriation is about saying that, you know, a host of different kinds of people do not belong to you. And if you write about these people, then it's stealing. And in an absolute sense, then eventually, uh, you know, if you take it to a, a kind of mathematical limit, then you're left with writing about yourself because you know, there's ultimately other people, it, it, they are another group, right? And you don't belong to that. It's not your group. So, and I, I think 
in general, modern fiction has mostly suffered from writers who only want to write about themselves. And I don't think this is to be encouraged. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and yet, when we speak about cultural appropriation, uh, you, you offered a definition in your speech. The one that I grew up with as a scholar of music was that it, it's specifically someone from a, a more enfranchised or privileged identity group taking the culture from someone from a less privileged identity group, that it has that power imbalance as part of this. Uh, so it's not all barring, it's specifically minority groups that uh, that would be invoked in a conversation about appropriation. Okay, yes, I, I, I realize that's part of the construct. I reject the construct, uh -huh. right? I'm sick of thinking of people this way. Um, I, don't, I don't like to think of people in terms of their group membership. It's not how I think about myself, so I don't see why I would want to impose that on others. Uh, it's a way of failing to understand people as well as as you, you use it as a tool to understand them. Um, I don't see why uh, a wealthy, uh, you know, son of a, an oil magnate in Nigeria uh, graduated from Harvard uh, is necessarily uh, marginalized, right? I mean, I just, the, these, these, these broad, strokes, categorizations of people who have power and people who don't, I just, they don't interest me. They don't help me in my understanding of other people. They are in, an impediment to the complexity of, of individuals. And I, you know, I, I, I reject the whole idea of what identity has become in, um, in our era. And when I was growing up, identity was all about a kind of self-knowledge, of self-possession, knowing what you like to do with your life, uh, knowing what your passions were, knowing some of the things you don't like to do. For example, I'm not really big on boats. I know that about myself. <laughs> I don't covet having a motorboat. Um, and, and it was also about things that, things that you, you know, your tastes. Uh, you know, you know the authors you like. You know the music that you like to listen to. Uh, that was in having an identity, and now it's all about aspects of yourself that you have no control over, and that's a loss to me. And it's a, it defies what, what being a person is to me. It's helpless. It's uh, passive. And, and of course, in its modern incarnation, it's resentful. So, uh, and we're, we are rewarding people who, who, who feel the most aggrieved. And these are not nice emotions. They're, they're emotions I write about all the time because they're intense and they're unpleasant and I write about un, un, unpleasant emotions, but they're not nice to be around. And most of all, they're not even nice to inhabit. The grievance and resentment they're really disagreeable as a, as a sensation. So that's one of the most offbeat aspects of encouraging people to embrace their own victimization is, I don't think it's a formula for any kind of happiness. When, when I look at the responses to that, to that speech, uh, the, to me, the most notable one was in The Guardian. Uh, and this was Yasmin Abdul Magaib. I believe from uh, from Australia. She's uh, the one who walked out. The one who walked out, correct? Uh, from, from which, the in the press, became the entire audience storming the, for the doors. But never mind that. Uh, and and when she, when she wrote her piece, to me, I tried to read it first. I was trying to, to to see what I found the most most persuasive response. It it was that we live in a world today where Certain, certain classes, certain groups, certain ethnic groups, ethnicities, genders, so on, uh, are not able to put out into the public conversation a definition of themselves. 
as easily as others. And therefore we should be sensitive to how they are characterized in the public sphere um, because there's a, there's a sort of power imbalance. And, and for that reason, there should be increased regulation over how these identities are presented. Is that an argument that, that resonates with you at all? No. <laughs> I think you knew it wouldn't. I mean, in the UK, and so far we've avoided this, so mm -hmm. fingers crossed. But in the UK, they have hate speech laws. We don't have them in the United States. We do have hate crime laws, but not hate speech laws. And that, you know, and when it when anyone tries to any state, for example, tries to bring them in, they've been struck down. They're, they they are a violation of our freedom of speech. And I think it's an important to, distinction to maintain about the US. But in the UK, they, you know, they don't have a written constitution, much less a First Amendment. So they have hate speech laws. And they apply to uh, discrete groups uh, with so-called protected characteristics which I, you know, just, I don't, I don't like the sound of it. And if you have one of these protected characteristics, then a completely different raft of laws applies to you. Um, and in relation to hate speech laws, it means that it, you can claim that, you know, the woman in the green shirt over there, she said, she said something that hurt my feelings. She, she insulted me. I felt I felt racially abused, or I, I, I felt that she was impugning my sexual preferences. And therefore, it is true. That accusation makes it true legally, which is appalling. Now, the whole, oh, unsurprisingly, the list of protected characteristics keeps getting longer and longer. Uh, and uh, to me, the whole concept is a violation of one of the, the central concepts of, of Western democracy. And that is equality under the law. It's, you know, we all have to obey the same laws. We're all, uh, we all face the same uh, rules if we're taken to court. Nobody gets treated special, not even the president or ex-presidents. Um, and and that's not that is no longer the case in the UK. Everyone, people, everyone, uh, groups get their special laws. And I think this is a catastrophe, and I I don't want to see it here. Or in fiction. Not yeah, uh -huh. certainly not in my books, except as a as the focus of fun. <laughs> uh, so this the, the, it, to speak about the other the other two pieces that. Uh, that nearly led to, or at least that led to campaigns against you, formal campaigns against you. Uh, one of them was about publishing, mm -hmm. too, and and quotas and this this new agenda with uh, Penguin Random House. What was the blowback that you experienced for that mm -hmm. particular piece like? What what I was arguing is that you know I I don't. I don't like quotas. I don't like hiring quotas. I, I, I don't like the idea of quotas in terms of, you know, our writer list of writers has to have a certain proportion of Asians on it. You know, I just I think that's a not obnoxious way to run your company, uh, and it's not putting the quality forward. That's, you know, I I I don't care who writes a book as long as it's good. Uh, and therefore, that's the way publishers should be thinking. Uh, this was interpreted as, I don't think minorities can write. Now, it would have taken a lot of imagination to get from the column to that, to that position. But that's one of the things that's happening now, is that it doesn't really matter what you wrote and what it meant to any rational, normal person who knows how to read, but the, what your opponents want you to have said is imposed on it. And so 
I, I, a lot of the attacks on that were, it's just like shooting right past the, the point of the column. And uh, so I got an indignant open letter from the, um, the members of a, uh, a group of young minority writers who had, you know, been subject to an outreach program, which I don't have any problem with. Uh, and they were offended because, I, you know, they, they interpreted uh, what I wrote as, as claiming that they didn't have any talent. Um, so I wrote, you know, I wrote them back in the Spectator, and uh, and I I wish them luck, but I warned them that one of the things that they may have to prepare themselves for, and, which I regretted, is a future in which the written word no longer works, because when your audience can impose a completely new meaning on what you wrote, there's no point in writing anything. And that was, that was ultimately my intellectual and emotional response to that particular failed cancellation attempt. Hmm. What would, if, if the publishing world has been more restricted and, and let's say unavailable to certain to certain voices to certain groups, mm -hmm. do you think that any reform should be taken? Any formal approach to changing that, or is or is that a matter of the culture at large? I mean, publishing has already bent over backwards to de-whitify <laughs> their their uh, their writers, and you know, I. I I certainly don't see this as a bad thing, um, as long as the books are any good. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that's the one condition I would I would put on it. Other than that, uh, I, I'm I am enthusiastic if what they're doing is also finding new readerships because readerships are thin on the ground. Most of us are sitting in front of Netflix, so you know if it's a matter of of discovering whole new uh, groups of people who didn't realize that they enjoyed reading uh, until they discovered that people who share uh, a, a lot of their experience of the world are, are now writing about that experience and now they're reading all the time. I think that's great. I think that is not, as, not happening as much as, as publishing would wish. And wh where I get uh, exasperated with all these uh, elaborate and showy efforts to diversify is that it's too much about um, it's too much about the company. It's too much about a kind of moral showing off rather than it is uh, a practical business strategy uh, or, 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 you know, ideally a response to uh, many more submissions of from lots of different groups of people, which are, which are wonderful, and and deserve to to find their audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the it's the distortion that I don't like that the distortion of purpose, and and also, if I may go so far as to say, I think there's an implicit insult to. Uh, writers from minority backgrounds, and I would say this about all forms of affirmative action, uh, because if it does come across to bookstore customers that you're just trying to show how, how woke and right on your company is, they're gonna look at those books a little askance like, oh, right, another, you know, another Asian author, another black author, right. Well, I'm not so sure they published that because it was a good book. You know, and this has happened with uh, a lot of short lists on uh, for for literary prizes. You know, the the book buyer looks at them and, you know, it's in a, still in a predominantly white country and uh, five of the six people are minorities. And the, the book buyer thinks, hmm, 
are they just, is this just PR? Um, did, the, did the judges just want to be thought well of? Or are these really great books? So it casts doubt on the talent of the very people they're trying to help. It backfires. And this is, you know, that's what happens with affirmative action. It, it actually makes members of minorities look as if they need help. And if I belonged to any of those minorities, I would resent them. If we can briefly, before we get more to, to, to the reaction to these, uh, talk also about the third article. You wrote a piece uh, in The Spectator as well. Uh, this is 2018 uh, about uh, immigration. Right. And, uh, and the changing demographic profile of the UK. Uh, the the piece uh, the concept of your argumentation wasn't uh, wasn't that opaque. It wasn't opaque at all. It was to say that okay, look, this uh, the demographics are changing, um, and you argued that there was no space to express concern, apprehension, yes. let alone uh, consternation was 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 your term, um, and that that piece drove a great deal of, of backlash, especially on Twitter. And you were, uh, some of the, you were called, so that you were endorsing the great replacement theory, yeah. for example. Yeah. Um, but you chose, did, did you respond to this piece in writing? Did you go out and answer your critics? No, I didn't bother. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that works. Uh -huh. uh, I was making an argument, which of course was widely overlooked, uh, but it was the central argument of the column, which is that um, we are a naturally political species. We can't help but separate into groups. And so we, it's not common for, for our species to, act as if we're all just one big happy human family. It's a nice liberal idea, but that's not how we function. And um, the truth is that whenever you have uh, a polity that has a, a, a dominant majority, and then suddenly huge numbers of people come in from somewhere else, uh, the dominant majority doesn't like it. That is what people are like. And I gave, and I said, this does not necessarily have anything to do with race. And I cited, cited multiple examples. Um, uh, the South Africans uh, re resent all the immigrants from Zimbabwe. The Kenyans resent all the immigrants from Somalia. The Colombians resent all the immigrants from Venezuela. Uh, and the Mexicans, I love this one, this is my favorite, the Mexicans resent all the American retirees who are coming in on the coasts and buying up the property. And, you know, there are a lot of them now. And most, most of the box pops I've read uh, uh, from Mexicans in these communities uh, have no self-consciousness about feeling completely at ease with uh, coming north, that, that there's no hypocrisy there. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually sympathetic. I'm sure that uh, retiring Americans are, are driving up property prices and talking English all the time and changing the touch and feel of these communities. And, you know, um, and they, feel, they feel a little invaded because that's what people are like. We're all like that. And, you know, but uh, therefore requiring white Westerners and only white Westerners to not only be welcoming, but to completely uh, ignore any sense of, gosh, this, this neighborhood is sure changing. And uh, uh, no, you, you I, I feel a little weird here or uh, feel, you know, who feel a little displaced. Um, they're, not, they're not allowed to say anything. These are the only people on earth who are saying, 
not only can you not, you can't object, you have to be happy about it. You have to be thrilled about it. You have more diversity in your neighborhood and that's great. And you know, there is, there is a way in which it's great, but to tell people that they can only have positive emotions about mass immigration, much of which is illegal in the, your own country's terms, it's just not fair. It's not psychologically fair. Mm. It's a, and, that, and that's a very tricky point to make. And, uh, and I wasn't surprised that I, that I got a little stick, but that's because, because my thesis was true because Western majorities are not allowed to say anything negative about immigration. It's just not permitted. And yet all over the world, they've got these same problems and these same frictions and they're tra dealing with these same emotions and, so, and, and quite overtly. I, I, I'm reminded when I hear you speaking about that, when Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, who you, you celebrate in your book at one moment, or at least as being, uh, as being articulate, having a way with words, which he, should, he certainly did, he criticized the Tea Party in the United States for the way that it spoke, you know, or at least implied race in his mind. Uh, but he very subtly afterwards said, but we need to have a conversation about this. And we have to have a conversation about change. It must be done with a great deal of, of delicacy, but it has to take place. I thought of that when I read, uh, read your piece. Yeah. Um, so. Well, when you, when you yeah. tell people that they can't feel things, mm -hmm. you get yourself in trouble because it means that you're, you're telling them that they have to lie to others perhaps even lie to themselves. Uh, and, and you're making people angry, which, and, and you are weighing, it means that someone can come along who finally voices what has not been permitted. And you give those people, sometimes rather unpleasant people, not naming any names, um, tremendous power. And in that scenario, you would not get to choose again who would come along and pick up, yeah. pick up those pieces. Uh, yes, now you were called quite a bit. You were attacked for, for uh, a lot on, on Twitter in particular for this as for the other, uh, the other pieces. And yet you still have your job. You are here speaking to us this evening. You have your publisher, Harper Collins. You have your agents, uh, you have your column at the spectators, you were not, in other words, canceled. Um, even though the campaign uh, came for you, is this a matter of brave publishers in your case, being willing to have a controversial author? Is this just a matter of, of the spectator, let's say, alternately Harper's? I think the fact that I'm I still have a public presence is predominantly not down to me and my incredible bravery or persistence or anything like that. Because as I noted at the very beginning, cancellation is all about the medium, the middle, the middleman, the it's, it's not about the individual. It's not actually about, you know, being assassinated in any literal sense. It's having your, your ability to, to communicate assassinated. And I, I think that, that my persistence is entirely attributable to uh, the editors, publishers, uh, and, and other people who, who give me a platform and their loyalty, their ideological bravery or openness to uh, uh, putting out a variety of views. And, and I think that the, the, the fact that we have cancel culture at all is, is not so much a testimony to how nutty people are and how vicious they are on social media. It is a testimony to weakness and cowardice and uh, willingness to be manipulated uh, at the top, it's, it's people in positions of authority 
who are acting as if they don't have any authority. Uh, they're failing to use their real worldly power in, in, in a moral way. And that includes a lot of uh, uh, university administrators because this whole cancellation business is, is a huge issue uh, in uh, higher education right now. Uh, it, across the board, uh, companies, uh, university administrators, publishers, editors of magazines, you know, they have been very disappointing. And um, if, if they were just willing to sit there and say, okay, and by the way, this does sometimes happen, um, you don't like that, you don't have to go to school. You don't have to go to school here. You don't have to work here. You know, you, you can go somewhere else. You don't have to buy those books if you don't like them. Uh, too bad, we're gonna keep pu putting them out. Um, you know, Netflix did that quite recently uh, with the Dave Chappelle special, which rubbed a number of people the wrong way, including at the company. And uh, Netflix held their ground. The Chappelle special stayed online. Uh, and this is what should happen. The uh, Netflix just did a round of, uh, of cuts, job cuts. And lo and behold, a lot of the people who lost their jobs were the same people who were complaining. That's, that's exercising your, your power, your authority. You know, if you don't like it here and you don't like the decisions that, that we're making here, you don't like what we produced, we'll go work somewhere else. Fine. You know? So that's holding your ground. And that's the level in which uh, we need to see a little strength determination and, and willingness to take blowback. You know, I just, I think people, people in positions of, of authority, it just takes social media too, too seriously. All this frenzy, these, these waves of hysteria, you know, you just wipe them out and they go away. It's not hard. I do it all the time. I'm not on social media. I can't tell you how easy it is for me to survive these, these shit fits because I don't pay any attention to them. Well, that's one technique. It's just is not be on social media. I, I wonder also the, the anti-woke movement. Um, yourself, Douglas Murray, Glenn Lowry was a guest uh, here on campus in the past. Um, is that is that part of the reason? Is, 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 might that have contributed to keeping you afloat throughout these campaigns? Well, I think there is a gathering anti-woke movement, and therefore I have a lot more colleagues than I used to. I, you know, mm -hmm. natural ideological bedfellows. Um, we were talking earlier. I think there's money in anti-woke. I have actually I've made a lot of money opposing the woke movement. Uh, just on individual, you know, commissions for this, that, and this and that article. I think, I think uh, I've made a tidy living off of it. And uh, so have a lot of other people. I would uh, encourage publishers to start recognizing that, uh, that they, they could be making money hand over fist on this pushback movement, if only because the truth is the anti-woke people actually represent most of the public, right? I mean, it, when, when you put what woke means in clear form, uh, and you take all the jargon out, uh, it's, it's putting forward a variety of premises that most people reject effortlessly. Uh, it's not the way uh, most publics see the world. It's, it's an ugly way of looking at people and, you know, if you're even trying to put over uh, propositions such as there's no such thing as biological sex, I'm sorry, but that just doesn't scan for most people. So, so that's why there's such a market. It's basically everybody. And, and then on the other hand, the woke stuff, it's unendurable. 
<laughs> it's unreadable and it's tedious. You know, it's preachy, it's self-righteous, it's full of jargon. Uh, I would, uh, you know, it's, it's just not entertaining. Whereas when you're in the position of, of poking at people from the sidelines and pillorying their more ludicrous positions, you can have a lot of fun and you can make a lot of jokes at their expense and it sells very well. I mean, Douglas Murray, uh, Douglas Murray is doing great. Uh, and uh, Bloomsbury, I, I don't know quite how it worked out over here, but I know that in the UK, Bloomsbury, which who, who, the publisher that, has, that he's had for years, uh, they had another staff revolt and they decided they couldn't afford to do Douglas's uh, The War in the West, which only came out, out about, I think about six months ago. And so they passed on it and it was picked up by another publisher, which has now made a fortune, you know? That was a big mistake. And I really enjoy these little stories. <laughs> so it's, and, and, and I also enjoy having a sense of um, Confederates. And I, and I feel that the ranks of my Confederates are growing and that helps. But I'll tell you the other thing that helps. And that is, I'm firmly of the opposition. And I, I, I you know, it's, it's not subtle what I think. The people that these, that, that the woke folks love going for more than anyone are their own or their very close adjacent allies. The people who want, who want to please the wokesters, who want to be accepted, who are traditionally of the left and may have some tiny little variation with the most extreme version of the hard left, uh, but are, yeah, they're, they're still trying to please. And they're gonna get really, really upset if you call them a racist. I, 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 I'm not even phased by calling it, being called a racist anymore. I never thought I'd say that, but it, it's, it's, it's flung at so many people so meaninglessly that, that it, it, it has lost its power to sting. But there's still some people out there that when you fling these, you know, you're a white supremacist at them, they, they, it really hurts their feelings and they, they panic and, and they're worried about the reputations. Those are the people who are in danger. Those are the people who get canceled. JK Rowling is a good example. She's a traditional left wing. You know, she has all the right opinions ex except on one issue, one issue. And it's even one opinion on one issue. But that's, that's enough. And she's a tantalizing car target because she's so close to them. People, I guess we're, we may be also dealing with another kind of universal of human nature. People take the most savor in taking down their immediate neighbors, people closest to them, to who, who, where there's a lot of affinity. That's where the biggest disagreements are. Uh, I think that you see, you see this a lot now in very left wing oriented organizations that are tearing each other apart from the inside because they have these tiny ideological differences and they're eating each other alive. And, and whereas I am, am now safely positioned as, you know, I don't like these people, I don't share their opinions and, and I'm, am therefore I'm not any fun to, to, to go for. It's, I'm, no, I'm no longer in, that, in the right population. I mean, to, to that point, back to the question of, of publishers and agents, if you were writing for the New York Times today, if you published, let's say, the, the article about immigration in the New mm -hmm. York Times today, would you be canceled? Would you lose your, lose your column? Well, of course, I don't have a column in the New York Times. Yes. Were you to? Were you to um, have a column? And I am unlikely to have one. <laughs> uh, I don't feel that my, I, I think I've tested the spectator. And I don't think I'm likely to lose my column. I mean, I could see losing my column because I had become repetitive. Um, I had run out of ideas. 
uh, I kept filing late or I filed sloppy text that they had to keep cleaning up. They hardly ever text, touch my text. Um, so, you know, there are any number of reasons you might move a columnist on. I mean, you know, we've had enough of you. Uh, columnists run out of steam. They, and, and I could, I, but I don't think that they're going to get rid of me because my views are unacceptable. Right. Uh, you know, I used to write a fair bit for The Guardian. I don't anymore. Um, and that doesn't surprise me because, you know, because of what's happened in the last decade, uh, there's been this huge separating off. And because I have now located myself very firmly in the anti-woke, you know, whatever we're calling ourselves lately, uh, then, then, then I become toxic to, to the likes of the Guardian. So, you know, uh, probably the most uh, small C Catholic a publication I'm writing for right now is the London Times, which uh, was uh, in British terms, a, a remainder publication and I've supported Brexit, uh, but they seem happy to have me. So th that's, that's a nice way to reach a audience, a less mm -hmm. segregated audience. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, because this is something that you asked Douglas Murray, uh, in, in 2019, you had a, a spectator event with Douglas Murray and you said, to what extent do you rely on being gay yourself to have standing to talk about these matters? That is to say the cause of minorities, minority emancipation. And I would wanna ask you, Lionel, if you might perhaps be a little bit more insulated from campaigns against yourself because at least you are a woman. Yeah, it's my one claim to victimhood. <laughs> um, but you know, being female hasn't protected an awful lot of women. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone like Kathleen Stock at Sussex mm -hmm. University mm -hmm. was clearly fired because of her gender views. Um, another, another example, by the way, of someone who has landed on her feet. Uh, she's joined this new outfit at the University of Austin, which is a, Deliberately, a free speech entity who's going to that's going to start mopping up all these uh, more outspoken um, post cancellation people. Uh, so there, yeah, there've been plenty of women uh, who who have suffered. I, I mean, after all, we are half the human race. So that if if being female protected you, uh, then then this. Then it would be it would be offering an awfully large umbrella, and I, I don't think historically that's been the case. <laughs> and also, you know, I am not constitutional. First of all, I'm not looking for an excuse. I don't enjoy a victimization. To the contrary, I find I, I I appreciate having been born into a very fortunate generation, uh, because uh, the one before me fought the really hard fights. And I just uh, collected the benefits. So one of the peculiar, uh, one of those peculiar benefits, is that I haven't had to make one of my big personal issues, um, women's liberation. You know, women's issues. I don't feel obliged to talk about women's issues. It's not that I don't have my opinions of, about access to abortion. I'm for it, uh, but. I don't take my sex as coming with a set of political obligations. That, that means that that's what I really have to focus on is uh, anything to do with women, this and that. And I kept a very pro, low profile during Me Too. And in, in fact, only weighed in uh, a, a little bit on the other side, just putting a little bit of thumb on the other side. It's like, have we, aren't we going a little too far here? And um, you know, some of my best friends are men, and um, we don't we don't really want to put women in in a in a circumstance where if you don't have some kind of tearjerker story uh, about some horrible thing that happened to you, then you know you 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 don't count as a real person. And I I, I thought that was a movement that had a a lot good a lot going for it at the beginning. 
the cases that it exposed were really important at the beginning. And then it went off completely off the rails. But, uh, but even there, you know, I didn't feel obliged to write about it all the time. It's just, it wasn't something I wanted to write about all the time. And, and I have been freed by the success of the women's movement to concern myself with other issues. And that's a huge gift to me. I, I do want to get to, to questions, uh, Lionel. One last question, though, from me while I have, while I have the floor. Uh, you mentioned Dave Chappelle earlier. Uh, one could say that any attempted cancellation, especially if it fails, as it did in the case of, of Dave Chappelle and his Comedy Central, that it seems to affirm some, some new rule uh, because uh, this whole process, this if we want to call it cancellation or our new political climate, the rules for it are something that we're working out as we go along, uh, right? If, if the failure of canceling Chappelle might be affirming the, what should we say, the comedian's right uh, to joke uh, about anyone, even, even if it offends, what might the failure to cancel Lionel Shriver mean about the rules? What might your survival attest to? Fuck the rules. <laughs> I'm not big on rules. And, um, and one of the frustrations of this entire period has been the rules. Now, where do they come from? Did you know that there's actually so, uh, some kind of so-called rule that you cannot use food metaphors in relation to skin color, food metaphors. So you can't say coffee colored skin. I think you could probably get away with uh, peaches and cream complexion. So that's a little inconsistency. Um, but my, my question is not only what is wrong with food metaphors uh, for anything, that's, that's a commonplace way of communicating a, a palate, right? Because foods, we know what they look like. It's a, you know, we don't all eat the same things, but we're, we're familiar with what a walnut, with the color of a walnut. So if you say something's walnut colored, most of us know more or less what that, that color is. That's a useful way of expressing color. But I'm less concerned with what, what's, you know, what's wrong with that? How is that insulting? Um, if I have olive colored skin, then where'd the rule come from and who made it up? And following on that, who says we have to obey them? You know, I don't understand this weird impulse. It's like, oh, you're not supposed to do that anymore. Oh, then, there, then okay. Oh, okay. I won't do that anymore. It's absurd. And, you know, let's have a little more Alice in Wonderland. They're nothing but a pack of cards. You know, I, I, I sod your rules. I don't, I'm going to compare skin color to as many foodstuffs as I can find. That's my response to that rule. I did hear a boiled ham evoked once to talk about a certain former president, as a matter of fact. Well, as a matter of fact, this expression, gammon, uh -huh. do you use that over here? Oh, that's a British thing. See, this is cultural sharing. I have appropriated British culture and I am bringing it to you. That's a food, it's a very unflattering food metaphor. A gammon is a ham. And uh, a gammon is a white guy who probably drinks too much is also completely full of shit and pro probably has right wing views and and uh, speaks you know has has explosive opinions and therefore the, the image is of a, a white guy who's who through both through drinking and an overexpression uh, it has a very a red or pink face so yeah, it's, it's, it's very insulting. So, fuck the rules is the outcome. <laughs> That'll be our next talk. <laughs> yes. We'll get that past the, the, the powers that be right. at the university. Good luck.
Right. Um, I would, I would uh, love to, to keep you for myself in this conversation, but let's turn to the audience. I'm going to be going back and forth, by the way, between the audience and our online viewers here. A real quick question first. Will there be a chance for a small group conversation with uh, Ms. Schreiber after this session is over or when we're finished here right now? Is that it? You're welcome to come up and talk to me afterwards. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to dinner in maybe, due course. Maybe even a few people together. So um, not rushing off to something else right away. We, we do have, have some evening plans, so I think it would be good to be brief okay. in your Thank you. Company. Yes. But if there's anything you want to raise right now, okay. be my guest. Most brilliant book I've read really in my life and I'm in my late 80s is we need to talk about heaven. And I think that you outline all of these things in heaven, all of them. Very few readers picked up on that. Mm -hmm. Very few readers also picked up on an underlying sense of kindness that was there, even in heaven. Uh, mm -hmm. Like when he knew what his mother see the eye in the box, all of these just little things. She didn't see that. Kindness, but she didn't know that's what it was. Mm. And that was only for Kevin or the reader, a perceptive reader. So, like, if I'm not too far off base, my question is against all of this resistance that we face in the publishing world and in society, is it the way around it? Back what you are so brilliant when you still about in fiction. Does that switch by? Mm. Well, I think my fiction is more even politically effective than my nonfiction. Uh -huh. And I think it's more important. Uh -huh. uh, I've some, uh, the, the one thing about putting together this collection that was um, disturbing is I found out how much nonfiction I'd actually written. <laughs> and there's ghastly amounts of it on my hard drive. Yeah. And that's where a lot of my time is going. And so one of the things that I took away from this project is, though I, I'm happy with it and I ended up spending a lot more time on that than I expected also, uh, is that is a sense of resolve that I need to recommit to changing the proportions a little bit. Because I, I just think that, that fiction in its elasticity, in its ability to uh, explore things through the back door, to embrace contradictions, to put completely different opposing views in the same text. Uh, it's, it's just a great medium and it's in, in an inviting medium. Whereas opinion journalism, which is now mostly what I write, it's an, it's a, it's a, it's a collusive medium, but it's also an adversarial one. And that's exclusionary. Uh, it's uh, for a certain proportion of your, not really your audience, it's, it's hostile. Uh, so it's not as warm. So I appreciate what you said about the book. I, I'm really glad that it means so much to you. We'll take one more in, oh. He keeps doing it over and over. <laughs> Essay slam. <laughs> let's let's take another question from from in the room, and then we'll go to a few uh, a few online. Uh, if we could start in the back, actually. All right. uh, I'm a staff here at campus, and I'm also teaching a class on ancient astronomers. I uh, was you know uh, interested to hear you mention how with uh, the Dave Chappelle Netflix case that. Uh, in their case, Netflix dealt with it by standing their ground, and yet Christopher Hitchens, who also you, you know uh, mentioned this, uh, he uh, would says, he would argue that the even the most hateful of speech deserves extra protection because it's the right of everyone in the audience to hear those opinions, and to silence those opinions is to make yourself a prisoner of others' voices. And so I'm wondering why is it that when Netflix is silencing and, and, 
firing people who want to revolt against them. That's actually them standing their ground rather than uh, them giving them extra protection and actually standing up for free speech. Well, I mean, there's a commercial entity and they are well within their rights to fire first the people who are not really on board the product they're producing. That, that makes commercial sense to me. I, I will say on, on Netflix's behalf, uh, they did not just outright fire the, the staff who objected to the Chappelle special, uh, but it was noted later that these people put themselves in the literal firing line. Um, and that, that just seems like rational commercial behavior to me. Um, and you, you, know, you made the larger point. Yes, definitely. The, uh, it's it's the, the opinions that you disagree with that need to be protected. I mean, it, the, the modern version of free speech that you get from the left now is that the only free speech they want to protect is is on is left wing speech? That's not the test. You have to be willing to let actual real white supremacists, and there are a few, march down the street and 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 shout mean things, and that's real free speech. That's the test, not the ability to say, you know, go Joe Biden. It's not. It's not it. Let's quick t take quickly, if we could, uh, a uh, question from online. You are speaking at a university here, and we have a question. What advice do you give to young people in academia who hold views similar to your own, but encounter pushback in the classroom and worry about cancellation slash putting their careers in jeopardy? I wish I found that question easier to answer, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I try to explain that I feel that, at least for the time being, the people for whom I write uh, have my back. And also I'm an in, ultimately a, an, an independent operator. I do need those people, but uh, I'm not part of a larger and complicated organization. And it's really hard to be even faintly right of center or even centrist uh, in a, uh, on a university campus today. That's true, I think, of both students and faculty um, and even tenured professors are in danger of losing their job, which I've, I'm afraid uh, invalidates the whole concept of tenure. I mean, it means that tenure it isn't what it was supposed to be. Uh, uh, someone in my position, it's very easy to dish out advice about, well, you know, you should express yourself and, and you, you should put yourself out there and encourage other students who might also be sympathetic with your views to be expressive, you know, try to break the, the rules, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's easy for me to say. And I don't, I don't blame, uh, people with the so-called wrong views, who don't want to lose their jobs, uh, who want to get along with uh, their fellow students for keeping their mouths shut. I really, I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question from online, and then we'll go back to the room. Uh, about the cancellation that hits closer to home, following the publication of your sixth book, you had a falling out with your family. How did your perspective about that quarrel change over the course of time? Hmm, that's there. an interesting question. Um, the book in, at issue is called A Perfectly Good Family, which my mother always misremembered as the perfect family. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only book that has some direct antecedents with my family. Uh, I, it, it was one of those weird situations where you were damned if you did and damned if you didn't because everything I changed upset them and anything I kept the same upset them. <laughs> um, and it did cause a big rift, uh, not only uh, with my parents, but also my younger brother. My older brother, who in some ways was, was portrayed 
uh, most negatively, loved the book. Um, uh, the rift eventually healed. Uh, what's, what's good about that question is, you know, basically, how do I feel about it now? Mm -hmm. There are single lines in the book which my parents misinterpreted that I wished that I would, I would be happy to be given the opportunity to rewrite because it wouldn't make any difference to the average reader's experience. It wouldn't have changed the quality of the book literarily and it might even have improved it. There's one in particular that sticks in my mind that apparently my father interpreted one sentence to mean that I did not think that he was an, a physically attractive man. Which, you know, broke my heart because actually my father was a very attractive man. And, um, and I, I was horrified to think that he, I thought otherwise. He read, he read the line wrong. Uh, I was trying to explain that, 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 that he was a person who his features hadn't quite settled when he was much younger and that he, he became more and more handsome which I thought was a compliment, but um, I'd rather it work that way than the other way around, which is the way it works for most people. Uh, so I changed that. And, you know, if I were to go through it again, I'd probably find two or three other sentences and then, you know, the rest I would keep the same. Um, I, I think all, all writers struggle with, you know, the, the original material of their lives and how to, how to be artistically true uh, and, and even true to their experience and at the same time not do too much personal damage. It's, it's very tricky. Uh, I, I certainly don't advocate a lot of gratuitous uh, insult and, and emotional damage. That said, now that my, both my parents have died last year, I can share with you that the book that I would write nowadays would not be nearly as kind as it was <laughs> in 1996. So they were lucky. <laughs> the question I should add closed out by saying thank you. You are one of the greatest writers of this generation. Oh, let's stop there. <laughs> <laughs> we can turn back to the hall for some more questions here. Yeah. Yes. So the, I want to ask you about the thing you pointed out in the beginning about how people who often most vociferously participate in cancel culture are also the most appreciative. And I, yes. I think there's a general phenomenon, right? So like often people who are one one meeting are pushing for affirmative action and that next meeting are saying how dare you suggest that there's no affirmative action here. Right. Or the, uh, people saying, you know, I demand you leader do what I say because I'm a marginalized voice. What? Uh, so I'm trying to ask psychologically, where do you think that comes from? Because the the they can't literally believe what they're saying, and so is the it, but it, is it is it a subconscious double speak? Do you think, or is it is, it, is there some element of shame there, or it, or is it maybe that that, that it somehow they understand the unpopularity of, of some of these tactics? Put yourself in in the in the mind of your own group or, or another group. Um, in relation to what opinion exactly, for example? Plenty of these things. The, the, a common feature of the political movement that we call woke mm -hmm. uh, is this, this double talk. We're, we're, we're doing this today, but we're denying the group that this exists the next day. Cancel culture begins to happen. Yeah. When people participate in that kind of double talk, what do you think is the psychology of Um, yeah, I'm reluctant to call it shame. I don't think it's overtly shame. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> it's not you. Um, I do find, I mean, just to stick on the term cancel culture, I do find it very interesting that the people doing it don't like that term. Hmm. Although there's a, I mean, you would actually, you would think that they would enjoy it because it is, it is describing their power 
right? Their successes, the many people whose lives they have ruined, uh, whose lives deserve to be ruined, right? Because these are bad people and they say bad things and they think bad thoughts and they should be sent to the cornfield. Um, Twilight Zone reference. Uh, but when you, when you pin them on it, then they pretend that, that they're not doing that. They're not getting anyone fired. Uh, and then they come up with more double talk about they're just holding people to account. And holding people to account just happens to entail they're losing their jobs. <laughs> so, but that's not cancellation. <laughs> and I, I think maybe it's, it, it's partly a matter of who owns the term. You've noticed that there is, there is this dual vocabulary now the other conspicuous example is the word woke itself, which started out as a, a self-description. It was proud. It was taken from the Black Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and it didn't last very long because it was appropriated uh, by the other side. And then they stopped using it because it didn't belong to them anywhere more. It had been co-opted. And Therefore, cancel culture is an expression used by people who don't like cancel culture. That, so the, therefore, the proponents of cancel culture can't use that term. And it may even come down to mostly that. One wonders uh, the phrase, you have a right to free speech, but not to escape the consequences of speech. I wonder how that will age after Rushdie. You have a, yeah, you have a, a right to free speech, but you don't. You know, and that's it's exactly what what he's talking about is this um, ha trying to have it both ways, and I and that's because there is some real discomfort with some of the woke positions, which is, for example, that they they don't believe in free speech, but they're uncomfortable in a country like this saying saying that expressly. It doesn't go down well. It doesn't doesn't sound good to the American ear. So it has to be disguised. There's a very compelling but strange question about water usage and legal, legal <laughs> restrictions of water usage that we got online. I'd love to ask it, but I think we should save our final question for something in house. So if we could, yes. I'm very young when the action was invented. And even then, the young person was insane because it's such an insult to all the competent minorities who made it through med school and law school and out there as engineers and professors or whatever on their own qualifications. And I recently read that starting this fall, it was like, yeah, it was in the piece in the journal, I think. Um, they, they're changing their admission standards and letting people who couldn't pass the MCAT. Yeah, this is really scary. Article. Did you read Heather McDonald's article on that? But, well, so, you know, letting people letting people get degrees that are qualified is the ultimate insult to the people who are qualified. Why, 20, 30 years ago, why haven't all the capable, successful minority people in this case, in this conversation, why haven't they been at the forefront of objecting to this? And instead, make their effort go to try to help the culture of the younger people or whatever it is that's keeping them from getting the right education so that they can pass the admission test and get into school. Mm -hmm. Why aren't the successful minority people at the forefront of fighting against all this nonsense? Is there, as you, as you said, what you can look at is like, that doctor's not, what if he's not really qualified? Uh, it, I don't it, know if I want to use him. Right yeah, it's, 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 it's a, a formula for the perpetuation of racism, honestly. Uh, and I a figure that, uh, a lot of people don't know is that something like 56% of black Americans don't like affirmative action, don't want it, and don't want it in universities either. Uh, this is a white concoction, actually. Uh, and I think it's condescending. And I realize that when a referenda have passed that make affirmative action illegal, and several states have done that. It's true that minority enrollment in schools like this one goes down, but I would rather uh, see a gradualist approach to the improvement of those statistics 
than this kind of manhandling, which does tremendous damage to the reputations of professionals who graduate from these schools. And, and, and as you mentioned, you know, doctors and lawyers, it, it casts doubt on their capability. And if I, were, if I were from a minority, I would find it tremendously obnoxious and, and patronizing. Well, of course, that 50%, 56% figure is uh, mostly ordinary people. Don't forget, there is a whole layer and of, of um, people making money off this stuff. The, the so-called DEI industry, the diversity, equity, and inclusion mm -hmm. crowd that got a big boost after the George Floyd murder. Uh, they are making very high salaries. Uh, and this has become a, you know, this, there are some people who are really benefiting from this stuff. And one of my objections to the huge surge in search for diversity, which is just another way of saying affirmative action after the George Floyd murder uh, is that the people who benefited from it most didn't need the help. It was a great deal of, of, of use to people, to minority professionals and artists and people in the media who are already doing great, right? So someone like Jonathan Capehart who was already at the Washington Post, naturally he walks into the, you know, the comment slot on PBS NewsHour. And that was very soon after George Floyd. Uh, and he was already in a position to be able to write his ticket. Those were the people who benefited. And those are the, a lot of the people who are benefiting from the DEI industry. So, you know, you've got a, a small uh, layer of people often you know from perfectly prosperous backgrounds uh, who, who don't who, who are who are benefiting from this system and are hardly going to object to it but i think it does tremendous social damage and i think we're we're from the same rough uh generation and i was um you know it, affirmative action first came in when i was 16 years old and i was horrified by, by it at 16, without having to think very hard. I just thought, well, this is awful. This is racist. This is anti-meritocratic. Uh, it's insulting. Uh, this, I, ho I sure ho hope this doesn't happen. You know, I hope this is a flash in the pan. And then, you know, 50 years later, uh, here we are still doing it. And I've written about this topic in the UK, partly because I think they need to be warned. They have not been using affirmative action and suddenly it says like they just discovered sliced bread. It's like, oh great, we can just make everyone hire a bunch of minorities and then, then everything will be okay and we won't have a systemically racist society anymore. So they think affirmative action or what they call positive discrimination uh, is the way to go. And and it isn't, and I'm, and I, and I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm, I'm from a country we've been doing this for 50 years. Uh, it's a disaster. And by the way, once you bring it in, it's almost impossible to get rid of. We are going to have to leave things there, uh, unfortunately. But I uh, want to say thanks to the audience for your questions. Thanks to everyone on online as well. And I'm very sorry we couldn't get to all of those questions. Uh, and thank you to our guest, Lionel Schreiber. Thank you. Thank you.